one factor that must absolutely be present is safety. Mm -hmm. My students are not going to learn well at all. If they come into the classroom and they're thinking, am I safe with Ms. Coons? Is she going to yell at me? Is she going to get mad at me? Is she going mm -hmm. to... They're, they're, they're not going to learn. It's that amygdala, that part of our brain that mm -hmm. wants to keep us safe is constantly scanning for danger, danger, danger. Mm -hmm. okay. Ruth Anna, welcome to the podcast. Thank uh, you. You've been an educator for a while, and there's a, there's a lot of different areas we could go with this, but I want to drill in on a couple of things specifically in the field of education that, mm -hmm. that you're involved with. Um, but before we get too specific, how many years have you been an educator? This is year 17. Year 17. Okay. Okay. So, so one of the areas when we had had a phone call before this and we were talking about, okay, what are the things we could discuss? You mentioned a term I, I hadn't ever heard before, neurodivergence. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us what that even is and why it does having an understanding of that term apply or matter to us and, and how does it affect how we view education? Sure. That is such a great question. So neurodivergence is kind of an umbrella term. It's a big word right now in education. Um, and it's it's the umbrella term for learning differences. So mm. you think autistic students, um, dyslexic students. So yeah, it's a, it's a big word in education right now. Um, so if you think of your student who learns in a typical way, mm -hmm. so let's say, you know, you as a teacher are lecturing and they're taking notes, they're listening to your lectures, um, they're reading and discovering information, mm -hmm. that's your neurotypical student, okay? Mm -hmm. okay? So not all of our students learn in the same way. And we know that, but I think in the past we've kind of treated education as a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not that. Mm -hmm. So your neurodivergent student is your student who learns in ways other than what are typical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as educators, you know, if we have classes of 22, 24 students, you are not going to just have neurotypical learners. Mm -hmm. And so how can we accommodate our students um, who are struggling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I mean when I talk about neurodivergent students. Mm -hmm. And the, that that makes a lot of sense, and I can immediately see why understanding this is actually a yes. pretty big deal, or it right. is important if we right. want to provide a, a reasonable education for these children. Um, wow. So this is a area that you have experience in, like you work with yes. neurodivergent. Yeah. So earlier in my, in my teaching career, um, I didn't – you know, really understand these things. And mm -hmm. so I'm I'm looking back at almost two decades of being in the classroom and seeing, you know, there were a lot of students that got missed in my classroom mm -hmm. because I just simply didn't understand what they needed. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes in our private schools, we don't always have all the resources that we need. Um, and so I think we're doing better at thinking about how can we how can we um, use our resources well? Mm -hmm. But there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. currently am pursuing a Bachelor of Education in Special Education from Liberty University. And part of the reason that um, I was interested in that major is because I really wanted to learn more about diverse learners. Like, mm -hmm. how can I service all of my students? How can I be responsible for all of them? And I realized, like, as a homeroom teacher, um, you can't do it all by yourself. Mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. lots of support. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I've, I've seen how having more understanding can really be empowering because if we're not understanding the learning difference well, we can actually end up um, – doing more harm mm -hmm. to our students and yeah that's not what we want to that's not what we want to do <laughs> yeah. yeah that that does make sense though because there is so much variety within yes. between different humans let's just say yes. very broadly speaking right so it would kind of make sense like we learn in different ways right um but i i see the the challenge here because if you're Okay, you have your classroom, you have 20 students. Uh, it's, it, it would be so easy for someone to get missed in that process. Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Yeah, wow. This is, this, is, uh, this is a challenge. I think some of this is too, just the complexity of the human brain. Is that an element that comes in here where we don't fully understand all of the different dynamics that are involved? Is, 
How, how does that play into this? Absolutely, yes. So let's let's talk about dyslexia for a little bit. Sure. So there's been um, a lot of myths around dyslexia. Um, I'm thinking I should have checked the research on this, but it's about 20% of your students that it's going to affect. So 20%? Yes. Oh, that's a lot more than I thought. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> wow. So as we take apart the term a little bit, dis, you know, having difficulty with lexia, language. So it is actually a... It is a language processing disorder. Okay. So, for example, dyslexic students are trying to use a different part of their brain to read than what your neurotypical students will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that can be can be really helpful. Well, just acknowledging the complexities here. Yes. Because, because, I mean, we're talking the human brain, right? right. So, <laughs> right. It, but again, some of the challenges probably because we don't fully understand all of these things. Right. Right? Yes. Yeah. So if you have your neurotypical student who's learning to read, um, they're actually using the back left part of their brain, like behind your ear. Oh, okay. Okay? So that's that's typical. A dyslexic student tends to use more of the right front part. And mm. so contrary to oh, yes. myths, is that it's a vision problem. My dyslexic students see backwards. Well, they don't actually see backwards. Uh, what, they, what they will tend to do as a coping skill is that they will tend to memorize word shapes. Because hearing oh. sounds, hearing differences in sounds is so complicated. Hmm. So if I give you the word sand right now, mm -hmm. you can tell me how many sounds are in sand, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we have and sand. They might not actually hear four sounds. They may only hear three. And. Mm. and so part of retraining their brain is training them how to listen for differences in sound. Yeah, okay. This is starting to make a lot more sense. Wow. Because, if, again, if you have a one-size-fits-all, though, someone like that, just they just kind of get lost in the right. shuffle. Right. right. Hmm. So typically what will happen with our students who have dyslexia, they they learn how to cope in these hmm. situations. So, you know, first grade, second grade, they can kind of get by by memorizing word shapes. Um, they hit third grade, and third grade is a lot more about reading to learn not learning to read. Mm. And so it's kind of, they sort of hit a magic wall, I would say, um, mm. where you, you're not going to be able to get by just by memorizing shapes. Mm -hmm. And so some of my job um, as a learning support tutor is assisting them through that, mm -hmm. literally helping them to rewire their brain so they can learn to read. <laughs> oh, that's that's kind of wild. That's actually kind of fantastic, though, that enough research has been done that we have at least this level of understanding yes. compared to, I don't know, 100 years ago or something. Right. Um, wow, that's, right. that's kind of... Hmm. It is It is very fascinating. So um, this is not a vision problem. Students aren't seeing backwards. But my 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 job is to, is to help them um, develop skills to learn to read well. Mm -hmm. So would you let me do a little experiment? Yes, of course. Okay. So one of the things, if I don't understand dyslexia well, um, I can end up doing some pretty harmful things. So you're a good reader, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm wondering if you would read this sentence for me. Okay. Um, it's not difficult, and I'm sure you've seen all these words before. Okay. Okay, tell me what you're seeing. You're a good reader, this Reagan. This is wild. That's wild. You need to try harder. <laughs> so, what word okay, so are you seeing? Are those complete words, or are they or are they um, split it, apart? It's a complete sentence. You've seen these words many times. So, start here. Oh, this. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, see, I'm, try I'm trying to find the pattern here. Gotcha. Yep. Keep going. This actual. Or actual. Look, you missed a word. This is. This is. is actually. Actually. Cool. 
quite ay 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 <laughs> quite easy to decode. <laughs> wow. Look at you. <laughs> Were you working hard? Yeah, but like in a different way. <laughs> right. Now, if I would have shown you the sentence, if I would have shown it to you like this, I thought I had it on the back there. Like you normally see it, you yeah. would have been able to read it no problem. This is easy to decode. But because because you're adding the layers, like almost right. like the levels, right. it, it imme- my brain immediately said this is scrambled. Yes. It, it's not, but it's exactly that's wild. So you see, this gives you a little bit of an experience what it's like to try to read as a dyslexic student. Yeah. What do you do when the letters move around? Yeah. You know, and yeah. Have, or you know, if you're, well, if you're I'm used moving. to the letters being um right in la- layers. Right. Got, layers, levels. Anyways. Right. That's so, wild. Okay, yeah. so you take you take a lack of understanding into this. If you're one of my reading students, you know, I say, Reagan, you need to try harder. Mm. Um, you can look at the word. Well, you are looking at the word. Mm-hmm. You are trying. Mm-hmm. And then you have the whole thing. Well, Reagan, you need to study this with me at recess. And mm. you're like Oh, no. I was already working so hard. Now I need to stay in at recess. Okay. Mm. And things just build. And Mm -hmm. then the behavior Mm. starts happening. And we want to try to manage the behavior. And there's all these layers to just not simply understanding what's actually going Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how I can cause trauma Mm -hmm. by lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. Well, and that does seem to to tie in very closely with another one that I want to have you describe a bit. Yeah. Because when we were on the phone before, we were talking through like, okay, what are we going to cover on the podcast? You used a term I'd never heard before, uh, another one I'd never mm-hmm. heard, and that was academic trauma. Yes. And I can, I'm already seeing how, I, okay, I think I'm seeing how this might start going together with what you were just right. saying. So, yeah, tell me about what it, what is academic trauma? Define that for us. Yes. Okay. So let's take the let's take the phrase apart a little bit. So academic obviously has to do with school learning, mm-hmm. um, and trauma is a word that gets thrown around a lot these days. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm just going to try to define it a little bit for how I'm using it in this conversation. So trauma can be a life threatening event like a car accident, maybe you almost died, mm-hmm. you had, you lost a parent, um, you witnessed a shooting, abuse, neglect, like all of those things I would call big T trauma. They're, mm-hmm. they're life-threatening events. And the person is overwhelmed, does not feel resourced as to um, how to deal with the situation. So mm-hmm. feeling overwhelmed, feeling helpless, those are often um, symptoms of trauma. Mm-hmm. So now if you have, you know, a one case where um, I'm just going to say you yelled at your daughter, okay? Mm. She's probably not going to develop trauma over that. But, you know, you yell at your daughter every day, Mm -hmm. you know? It becomes verbally abusive. It becomes an overwhelming situation where your daughter is going to feel helpless, okay? So so we think about trauma. We, we, We know that by itself, the event by itself might not be threatening, but it was impactful. Mm. Um, and one of the things that we're learning about trauma is how it imprints on our nervous system. Mm. Mm. Okay. So um, let's say with our students now, let's say they have dyslexia or, you know, they're autistic and they're misunderstood. Mm. They come to school day after day after day after day. They're misunderstood. That creates this academic trauma for them. Does that mm. make sense? It, it really does. Um, would you be able to get it a bit practical? Yes. You like, I don't know, maybe you have some examples yes. if, if you can share those. Um, I, wow, I'm already seeing, <laughs> already thinking of some examples in my, uh, my own mind as well. But right. anyways, yes, right. go, go ahead. Yes. Let me share a story with you. Um, I was working with a, with a boy in middle school. He was dyslexic and he had ADHD hmm. and he was on my caseload And so I began working with him and I knew that he had transferred to our school um, in the, you know, recent past. And we're about two weeks into the school year and he made a comment to me and I I said, hmm, that must have been difficult. And that validation of his experience opened it up for him. And he began talking about how traumatic his past school had been. Mm. And I sat there and listened to him. And I said, 
Donnie, that must have been really hard. Mm -hmm. And he said, it was. But that began um, the process of, of a friendship and a real connection between us. Um, and one of the things that I told him, I said, um, you know, at our current school, we are going to do the best that we can to accommodate the way your brain works. We mm -hmm. want to make this a safe environment for you to learn. We're not going to do this perfectly, but that's our goal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, students are not, they're not concerned about us um, having every, inter or they're not concerned about every interaction being perfect. Mm -hmm. They want to be affirmed, I should say, they need to be affirmed and validated. Mm -hmm. So as he was opening up to me about his past story, he very vividly described his experience of depression. So think of this academic trauma that he's facing. And this is middle school. This is a middle school oh, boy. Oh, my. Yeah. This is a seventh grader. Mm. And I asked him about it a little bit, and he said, well, depression lasts all the way home from school. It lasts the whole way through the weekend. Mm -hmm. It lasts all through the holidays. And I just felt really sad about that. Like, mm -hmm. we don't want our teens to be having these experiences of depression. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my goal is not to shame his teachers or his former school. Mm -hmm. But my, my point is, can we have some understanding around... Um, you know, his, his learning differences and try to accommodate that mm -hmm. and create a safe environment. Because for someone who's experienced trauma, one factor that must absolutely be present is safety. Mm -hmm. My students are not going to learn well at all. If they come into the classroom and they're thinking, am I safe with Miss Coons? Is she going to yell at me? Is she going to get mad at me? Is she mm -hmm. going to... They're, they're, they're not going to learn. It's that amygdala, that part of our brain that mm -hmm. wants to keep us safe is constantly scanning for danger, 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 mm -hmm. okay? So my goal as a tutor when I get a new student who doesn't know me at all is to establish that relationship of rapport and safety. Mm -hmm. I think safety is a really key piece there. Yes. Right? I wonder things things like academic trauma uh, could potentially be much more widespread than we realize. Y absolutely. You know? uh, absolutely. Because it's just like, I don't know, you just kind of go through the day-to-day -day and um, you, you know what I mean. It's yes. just you can get in your routines and then suddenly like you're mentioning this particular case and then you, you start peeling back the curtain a bit and seeing how this student is actually feeling like, whoa, that – Wait a minute, that is not right. good, you know. And then right. you got to kind of wonder how many more cases are like that exactly. that we never hear about. Exactly. I'm speculating obviously is I'm not in the field of education necessarily. But. Right. Right. So I think one thing to think about often at our private schools, especially if it's a small private school, mm -hmm. they may not necessarily have a like a resource room or a learning support um room where you're mm -hmm. where your student is able to get some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Mm -hmm. So back to my middle school or some of the ways that we accommodated him, um, he caffeine would help his ADHD. And so he'd eat coffee beans before he came really? to my classroom. <laughs> no, and, you know, <laughs> That's it, great. Was, it was wonderful um, <laughs> because I'd get like this smell of like fresh ground coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That so is it was a positive guess, for both of us. <laughs> I was not ex where I expected that to go. I'm just saying, like, <laughs> possible solution, eat some right. coffee beans. But right. hey, like, I mean, that's, it yeah. sounds like it worked. For, for him, he was like, that's a amazing. little bit of caffeine just helps me to focus, you know. And then mm, on days yeah. when he would say, I just can't focus today. Okay. I would try to just really back off and we would just kind of, we would mm -hmm. slow mo it or just really go gently. Um, at it. The other thing for him is that reading black text on a white page was distracting for him. Mm. Um, and so sometimes overlays will help. Again, this is going to vary with your students. But for sure. him, I would give him like a green overlay and it would take away that contrast. It was a little easier on oh. his eyes to actually read. Oh, okay. I get that. That makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. 
So those are just a couple of practical mm-hmm. things that I'm mm-hmm. that I'm thinking about. The story with with him, um, I thought like had a beautiful ending. The year that he, um, so I I worked with him for a year, and at the end of that year, his mom wrote me this beautiful note, and she was thanking me for what I had done for her son. And her last line in the note was, thank you for helping him heal. And wow. that that just, like, causes me to worship. Like, the Lord can take, you know, my small understanding of these things mm-hmm. um, and, and make it into something really redemptive and restorative. Mm-hmm. And so that was a real moment of worship for me. Mm-hmm. So we were looking at some interesting pieces here with neurodivergence, mm-hmm. academic trauma, um, you know, especially the theme of safety. Yes. Or, yeah, but yeah, safety, like uh, students need to feel safe right. when they're with their teacher, et cetera. And a piece I'm thinking about is education can be an amazing experience, right? Mm-hmm. So like I, I was homeschooled um, and then went on to Bible school and college. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I had a great experience through all of that. Uh yeah, I, I really did. But I know not everybody has that. Right. And it's kind of easy to take for granted. Oh, yeah, it was fine. Like, why isn't every, you know, it, you just miss it, right? So there are many people don't have that experience. Mm-hmm. And I guess the question I have is, so how can we create better educational experiences for our children? Mm-hmm. Which is an, an enormous question. And I'm sure we won't answer all of that right, right here and now because every situation is different. Right. But at least give us some pieces to work with. Sure. Yes. That is such a good question. Um, yeah. Okay. There's there's a lot of ways we could go with this. Um, but since we're talking around the academic trauma, the learning difference piece, mm-hmm. I'm just – I'm going to kind of address that. Um, so how can we create better experiences? Um So I think especially if we are in a small school and we don't have um, all the resources that that are needed, um, I think we need to we need to think creatively. We'll maybe get to more of that in our next episode when we talk about burnout. Sure. Um, But I think, you know, there's a lot on homeroom teachers and. You know, let's say that they're teaching multiple grades. um, And have, you know, a really heavy workload. They don't have a lot of support. Mm. They're doing just multiple, um, you know, pieces with their students, teaching all the math, reading, Bible, all of that. Um, I think sometimes our teachers are so overloaded that they don't have, there's not enough brain space left to to develop this mindset of curiosity. Like, well, what is dyslexia, for Mm. example? Um, how can I accommodate that? Well, my student with uh, ADHD is doing this and, you know, what's actually going on with with that behavior? But I think our teachers are so overloaded, there's not always that space to think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think we, we need to think about how we can support our, mm-hmm. our teachers better. Um, so, yeah, cultivate a mindset of curiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm curious about or I'm curious about what that might mean. Um, Mm. Because behavior is always a language. Hmm. Hmm. So the mindset of curiosity is huge. Um, I think doing some research, seeking to understand um, what what would it be like to, you know, just like the example I gave you there with dyslexia. Well, that that helps us understand a little bit what it's like to be in their shoes. Um, I was actually, I have some friends that I just, I asked some questions um, to them just to see what they would have to say from the parent perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a friend who they have some adopted children. And in one conversation, I sensed that she was having some frustration around um, the whole thing of like trying to advocate for her child, but she wasn't feeling understood by the Mm -hmm. teachers. And so... I asked her a little bit about that. I said, so what can we do as educators to make it easier for you as parents to advocate for your children? Mm. And she said, Ruthanna, I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question. And I thought, mm. wow. Then this con- it, it showed me how this conversation is mm. so important. Mm-hmm. Um, so... It's really important as an educator to have a heart of compassion for our students. Mm-hmm. They they do feel that. I know we don't we don't always um, respond 
in the right ways. Okay. But they can feel if you have a heart of compassion. Mm -hmm. um, also, like having a heart posture of humility. So when a parent comes to me, um, they are, this is their child. They know how mm -hmm. this child works. Like being, being able to hear them um, and you know, sometimes they have suggestions for how how we can actually help this child thrive, okay? Mm -hmm. And I know on the other hand, sometimes they are so stressed and so in the moment that they're mm -hmm. just surviving. So mm -hmm. compassion, humility, um, fostering a classroom atmosphere that feels safe, mm -hmm. um, and then validation. And I find validation for parents who are dealing with children from hard places is really key too, because sometimes they need to hear from another source. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you for everything you are doing for your child. And so I think if we can develop this um, this team relationship where I'm working with the parents, they're working with me. Mm -hmm. It's not me against them or them against me. Mm. Almost um, it seems like you're using terminology that's collaborative, mm -hmm. synergetic. Mm -hmm. um, and and so forth, but it really, this sense of there's almost like a community element as well, right? Right. Uh, right. Instead of just like, hey, just kind of doing your thing and you're doing your thing and so forth. Right. Right. Mm. There's another piece that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about with this conversation right now, um, and this kind of comes back to the education one size fits all. Mm. So let's say that you have a school whose policy is, um, okay, well, if you are failing. If you have a failing grade in any subject, that means that that disqualifies you from, let's say, going on a field trip. Okay. So for certain students who may actually need that motivation, mm -hmm. that can be okay. Let's say you have a student who's dealing with a lot of trauma and like their brain is just kind of maxed to say, well, you're failing, you can't go on the field trip. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a really hurtful response. Mm -hmm. Or when parents hear like, well, we can't bend the rules for your child. Mm -hmm. um, that's the opposite of compassion and humility and mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. That sounds like um, danger, uh, dangerous or uh, difficult territory to navigate. Yes. <laughs> what you're describing there. Yes. You know. Yes, Oof. it can be. There's a thread in that, though, that, that stands out to me, and that's the compassion mm -hmm. side of things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, are, are we doing these things ultimately from a spirit of compassion? Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. You've, you're giving us a lot to think about in this episode. Good. Uh, education is, uh, you know, fairly complex. There's lots of opinions and different models and ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'll never cover everything on, on this podcast. But uh, kind of tying together the whole package, right, of, mm -hmm. of what we've done. What is one practical thing that a listener can take from this and, and take at least one step in the right direction when it comes to education, whatever their role may be in, mm -hmm. in their community? Mm -hmm. Ooh. One thing. Yeah, well, you can, <laughs> you can give us more if you like. <laughs> um, I think be curious. Hmm. Be a lifetime time learn. Be a, ugh, let me say that again. Be a lifelong learner. See yeah. if I can get that alliteration yeah. there. Um, I love learning about new things. And so, um, you know, in this case, it may mean learning differences. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot to just, you know, learn a little bit mm -hmm. um, about how you can help children who learn differently. So be curious, be compassionate, have mm -hmm. a stance of humility. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it means um, staying connected with the Lord, too, because we are we're human and that's a good thing. Um, we do. We have our limitations and. You know, there are days where, where it's really stressful. There's a lot on our plate. And I think in that case, it can be okay to say, you know what, Lord, I trust today that your grace is big enough to cover the gaps. Mm. Um, it, again, that thread that keeps coming up through this episode is the curiosity and the compassion. Yes. These are things that, that um, yeah, that's, that's really good. Ah, wow. I, I feel like I learned a lot on this one. Um, there's a lot to think about here, and I appreciate you taking the time to share on this because you know these topics can be a bit complex and and difficult right. to 
to, I don't know, work through. And yeah, I just appreciate you being willing to do that. Is there anything else you would like to leave us as we wrap this episode up? Thank you so much for inviting me on. I've just been delighted to be able to talk about some of these things that I'm <laughs> really passionate about. Mm, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode with Ruth Anna. If you found this interesting, you should check out this episode we did a number of years ago with Kyle Stalsfus on the topic of higher education. You can find that linked in the description down below. And of course, all our content is on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode.